You're watching the protocol.tv. How many people are familiar with Brock Pierce here? So he's probably one of the, if not the most prolific Bitcoin investor in the space. I think he did what, like 35 something deals this year uh, for different companies. Um, so he's pretty much invested across the, the spectrum of companies in the Bitcoin space. And so I want to bring Brock up to the stage here. It's also his birthday, so everybody say happy birthday. Obviously, Jim. He's an investor of our company, too. So, um, so uh, Thank you for the birthday wishes. Technically, yeah. that's at midnight tonight, though. <laughs> We're going to open this up to Q&A really, really soon. I just want to get it started. And um, I really want, want people in the audience to ask questions, because that's really where really the best content comes from. Uh, you guys are probably tired of hearing me speaking. So, <laughs> But uh, Brock, can you tell us maybe just a little bit of your background in terms of how you found cryptocurrency? Um, I know you have a long history there. It, uh, I guess it started out in the uh, late 90s, and I got moved into the business in the early 2000s, or specifically 2000. I had started a company in, during the dot-com bubble, uh, raised a bunch of money, ultimately imploded, and at the end of that process, it's called, okay, uh, I'm a college dropout, washed up actor, uh, lost nearly $100 million of other people's money, and the only skill I arguably have is as an internet entrepreneur at a time that no one wanted to talk internet. And the next idea I had is that people playing online games or that were you know, participating in these persistent worlds um, had a desire to buy and sell these digital assets, virtual currency, virtual goods, and uh, no game company really was doing that at the time. And so I created a secondary market facilitating players of these games to be able to buy or sell uh, these, these assets. And uh, uh, that ended up being an interesting idea because people playing games like World of Warcraft actually wanted to buy things or wanted to sell things. Uh, the problem I had, though, is that uh, I had more buyers than sellers, and so I needed to find a way to source more inventory. So I, had the ch I taught the Chinese how to actually play video games professionally for the purposes of mining uh, virtual currency to then sell into Western markets. And I built up a supply chain over 2002, 3, and 4 of about 400,000 people that were playing games to make money. So you know, the I these ideas were not novel to me. And over the, uh, the course of the 2000s, there were many conversations with people saying, well, what about building sort of an open loop currency, something that's you know outside of you know this closed loop system where that value only had value within that in you know call it closed world, similar to like a frequent flyer mile or uh, you know any of these sorts of affinity programs, and uh, you know the challenge is how do you actually get enough critical mass for that you know that asset to have value? And I was engaged in conversations for years and years and years, and so naturally Bitcoin showed up on my radar right from the beginning because people are saying, what do you think of this? I'm like, okay, I better take a look at it. <laughs> I better have an opinion. Uh, and my initial reaction was, wow, this is pretty cool and novel, but uh, you know, I've seen lots of people discuss things like this. I've seen lots of attempts at it, and I you know, admittedly didn't truly recognize you know, how novel Bitcoin was at the time, but my position was this or something like it is the future. You know, the question is, is the, is the future now or 25 years from now? And so I took a, you know, a sort of wait-and-see approach for a little while until uh, uh, Bitcoin actually pulled off what I thought was going to be incredibly challenging, which is creating a critical mass of users that have all agreed that this has value and so that a market actually you know, exists and has momentum. And the minute I saw that the future was now, I, I basically dropped everything I was doing uh, to jump into this space full time, subject to one last major concern, which was regulatory. It's called, okay, who's not going to like this and what are the risks in doing so? And I probably spent uh, a good three to six months operating in the space, mostly doing things like mining, a ninja, kind of trying to keep my uh, uh, my face out of the public as it related to the industry, and uh, uh, I decided to jump, you know, in and get very active in a more public fashion as soon as I realized it didn't really matter what this government or any developed, you know, sort of country did, because this still had incredible applications specifically in the emerging markets. And when I realized that I wouldn't be wasting my time, even if it were outlawed in a country like this, uh, I said, okay, there's no reason not to move. So. You, you were in the currency space for a very long time. Um, the question I have for you is, wh what is intrinsic value? Or what, it, what is it that gives currency value? Why does something have value? Because, you know, obviously video game currency was, uh, up until when you created that market, was just a closed loop system. And really, um, 
was only useful for buying you know goods and services in that inside of that game. How did it break through that, and why does it have real value? Well, uh, I guess you know intrinsic value in most of these things is ultimately because of consensus. Uh, we all agree, or because we have faith or trust in some system that's you know been imposed on us. As it relates to the the video game space, it was ultimately two sort of motivations. Uh, one is it provided utility. You know, it enhanced your gameplay experience in some per, for some particular reason, or there was sort of social status and vanity. You know, you can buy a Lamborghini or you can buy a Prius. You know, some people choose to have something, you know, different, though it's not necessarily providing much greater utility, but it changes your sort of social status in a particular market. And those were the two motivations for people playing these games. But, uh, yeah, intrinsic value, what is gold really worth? You know, I, I don't think that gold has all, much that, all that much value. It has all the attributes that you've identified, which made it a, a very good you know, uh, uh, form of money. But most of the value in gold is just because it's been being used for thousands of years because it had those attributes. It's not because it's really worth all that much. Uh, and uh, you know, I mean, why, why do US dollars have value? I guess it's primarily because we have to pay our taxes with it. So there's, there's utility in paying our taxes. Well, it's, <laughs> it's called we don't have a choice. Yeah, <laughs> uh, fiat. So yeah. Um, does Bitcoin have that? I mean, you know, what, what is I, what, there intrinsic the value in Bitcoin itself? I, I guess it's ultimately the Bitcoin blockchain and the the cost of replicating it. You know, the that all that mining sort of infrastructure uh, and the cost to replicate it could be argued to have some sort of intrinsic value. Uh, you could look at, you know, you. I mean, how do we, you know, value anything? How do you kind of look back? What is the inter enterprise value of an asset? And, I mean, there, there's, there's arguments I could make that there is intrinsic value, and I could make arguments that there is none. The question is, is it a good form of money? And it's, you know, it has all the attributes of gold, but better. Uh, in pretty much every single way, it only lacks one attribute that gold has, which is its intangibility. Yeah. Um, so I get a question a lot, then, is, you know, especially when you talk to banks, because, you know, banks, um, they're very uh, sort of old world, old world mentality, and it's hard for them to imagine that, you know, some upstart currency would ever take over uh, their job, you know. So they're, they're, what they always tell me is they say, you know, we're really fascinated and interested in blockchain technology, but we don't believe in the currency. Where do you stand on that between the two? Well, I think that that's uh, uh, going to be the, the general response of most people that live in the developed world, because uh, for most of us, uh, you know, we, you know, we're fortunate enough to be uh, born in a place and in a household where our families had access to bank accounts, and uh, you know, we live in a country where there's, you know, mature sort of payments infrastructure and credit cards that make things convenient. Uh, most people have faith in the commercial system. We've got rule of law, you know, that's supposed to be there to protect us. And of the 200 currencies in the world. If you're from the developed world, you actually have one of the currencies that most of us would actually like more of. And so when you come from that sort of state of mind, and that's, you know, what you know, uh, it, it's easy to form that opinion because, you know, the, the marginal utility and the way that it impacts your life is, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's not massive. It's not the sort of thing that's going to change your life by an order of magnitude. I mean, the U.S. dollar is, you know, decreasing in value, you know, the purchasing power of it by about 2% a year. And... You know, for most people, that's not, you know, you, you don't really feel it in the same way that you boil a frog. Um, but uh, now, if you're a member of the 70 million people in the United States that are part of the on or underbanked, or if we go south of the border and take a look at Mexico, you take a look at south, you know, uh, all of South America for that matter, specifically Argentina and Venezuela, you go take a look at Africa, you take a look at Southeast Asia, where uh, all the things that I just described that we have, for the most part, they don't have. The vast majority of the populations aren't banked. You know, uh, currencies, you know, are incredibly unstable and, you know, in your lifetime, you're most likely going to see your country or one of your neighboring countries, you know, entire financial system collapse and all of your family's wealth and savings, you know, being, you know, basically vanishing on you overnight. Uh, you have a bunch of these sorts of issues that make something like Bitcoin as a currency, I think, you know, it's a far better thing that will enhance your life by an order of magnitude. And if you take a look at something like Africa, where you know, this infrastructure doesn't exist in the same way that they leapfrogged wired telecommunication and went straight to wireless because they had, you know, none of that sort of incumbent infrastructure there. 
uh, you know, they can leapfrog into something far more advanced. And if you think about like a place like the Philippines and, and these spots, I would argue in the Philippines less than 5% of the population is banked by our standards. You know, they have the ability in a very, very short period of time for the entire population to be banked. It should take 10, 20, 30 years for the developing world to you know, catch up with what, what we'd call our financial infrastructure. And now in the matter of months or years, they can not just catch up with our infrastructure, they have the ability to surpass our infrastructure and actually have a better financial infrastructure because of the blockchain, Bitcoin, or potentially even a central bank in some of these places putting their currency on it. But again, in a lot of these places, their currencies don't, you know, they don't have the same benefit that the U.S. dollar has. You know, the U.S. dollar is not going to go away anytime soon. Do you think, do you think it ever will? Do you think that th this will be a currency that actually replaces all currencies or something like it? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, everything fails eventually. Uh, everything. It just, uh, you know, this is too big to fail, at least in the near term. Uh, but, uh, I mean, everything fails eventually. So the question is, is it going to be in the next 10 years, 100 years, you know, 500 years? But I'd say at some point, uh, you know, that's likely to happen if you look at history. So do you, do you think uh, we'll have banks in, in 50 years? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that all intermediaries go away uh, because of uh, uh, the blockchain and what this technology enables. Uh, it eliminates intermediaries and counterparties that are not adding value. You know, there's, if you look at the value chain, it's comprised of many, many sort of intermediaries that are performing some particular function that likely had a use at some point in the past. You know, but a lot of those things aren't needed and a lot of them are not even providing any value today. I mean, a, a, a great example of that, of anyone that, you know, bought any real estate or sold any that, you know, I find just to be com utterly worthless is, you know, things like title insurance where you're paying 1% of the value of your transaction for what? So some company can go say that there's a clear chain of title. By using the blockchain, you could do one transaction where that insurance company has now said the chain of title is clear. Put that onto the blockchain where you have a complete, you know, you have a, a public ledger that is showing that chain of title. Right. And you've eliminated that and we all save 1% anytime we do a real estate transaction. That's what I'd call a, yeah. a counterparty that is adding no value. Uh, you know, now in, to use another real estate example, the real estate agent, you know, or the real estate platform, you know, that's connecting buyers and sellers is providing some value, whether it be marketing, they're, they're enhancing the value of your property, they're connecting you with someone that might buy it, they're facilitating a sale. And that would be an example of a counterparty that's providing value and a counterparty that's, you know, not really adding any. So the value chain will likely be collapsed. A bunch of intermediaries will be disintermediated. And in the end, we, the consumers, will benefit. So do I think that we'll, you know, have things look, that look like banks? I mean, it depends on what your definition of a bank is and what specific role. The idea of just storing our money, yeah, they're probably going to look like Bitcoin wallets. Uh, you know, and I could argue maybe that is what a bank is in, in, in the future. But do I think that there's going to be some tool, service, or, you know, entity, or, well, well I'll avoid getting into the decentralized, you know, sort of, entities or DAX and DAOs, but is there somebody there that's able to add value by creating a product or service that helps us facilitate, you know, payments and transfers of, you know, things? I, I believe ultimately that's true, uh, at least for some period of time until everyone can program and there's no need. But again, even still, there's, there's an opportunity for someone to create interfaces that make those sort of actions easier in a way where we agree that there's value that's been provided. Yeah, I, th I think that's roughly true. Um, you know, th this crowd here all has Bitcoins, so maybe we'll actually approach uh, distributed organizations, um, something we don't usually do. But uh, I would love to talk to you more about, I mean, I know you're actively involved in, in a lot of uh, blockchain 2.0 type projects. Um, first of all, can you define blockchain 2.0 or Bitcoin 2.0 and, and then tell us what's interesting that's going on in that space? Yeah, well, I guess my definition is, you know, there's probably a number of different definitions, but I think of it as anything where you've moved beyond uh, Bitcoin, the currency, and where you're figuring out how to use either the sort of blockchain protocol uh, for some other use case, whether that be, you know, uh, title insurance like we just talked about and showing that, you know, using that ledger as a way of uh, uh, facilitating the transfer of some other uh, asset or settling of it. Uh, 
things like smart contracts, anything that you're building on top of that second layer, whether you're using a, a platform like Counterparty or you know the Master Core Protocol or Colored Coins or you know soon to be side chains. Uh, I think of anything kind of beyond the currency and things that just facilitate you know basic application, you, you know transfers and payments and things of that nature with the currency is what I call kind of Bitcoin 2.0. And, and what do you think is really exciting in that space that's going on right now? You're really on, you know, the pulse of it. Well, I still think we're uh, uh, kind of where Bitcoin was in, you know, call it 2008 or 9. You know, most of it's still a white paper. You know, it's mostly conceptual. You know, some of it now is, you know, seeing the beginning of the light of day. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm fascinated by sort of the utility of this technology beyond just the currency, but it's still kind of early days. Uh, the, the things that I find... Uh, I mean, smart contracts, and, and I'm just dying to meet people that come up with interesting applications of how can you build smart contracts into anything utilizing the blockchain. Uh, uh, the reality is I haven't seen uh, that many, call it, good applications or people that have identified a specific market use case and actually developed it and pulled it off in any way. But I'm very eager to meet those and find ways to participate and helping those people uh, grow their projects. Um, I think uh, uh, Reeves, Reeves here in the room that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, not everyone likes this idea, but I think it's an interesting one, which is putting fiat currency, or in this case, the US dollar, on the blockchain. Uh, I think it's a, an incredible gateway to uh, uh, engaging people uh, with the technology uh, as a way where it's often hard to sell, you know, anyone that's in this room right now is taking the time to uh, think, which is, you know, unfortunately not true of everyone. Uh, uh, it takes time for, you know, early adopters are the ones that have taken the time to say, hey, this is interesting, I'm going to go spend an hour to learn more about it, but most people in life don't contribute an hour to go learn about something interesting until, you know, kind of the, the really early adopters are followed by that next wave of adopters and so on and so forth. And so Bitcoin can be intimidating to a lot of people. It certainly had its run through, you know, sort of reputational issues due to sort of media sensationalism, uh, mostly things that are not really large issues, but, you know, that's what the media does. You know, they're there to make stories that people want to read uh, by having a controversial headline, clickbait. But um, uh, I think it's a great way to give people what at least many people around the world already want. You know, you go out and offer anyone dollars and pretty much everyone's going to say, yes, I'll take them. Maybe you want to convert them to Bitcoin immediately following that, but, you know, pretty much anyone will take a dollar. And uh, uh, putting the dollar into the ecosystem and using the same applications and making it all interoperable, I think is a great way to get people engaged in a product like this and where Bitcoin's in their face all the time and eventually they're going to get it as you go through these adoption curves. But uh, I think that's a pretty interesting application. I love, I mean, I'm a believer that uh, uh, the stock markets, what you've seen over stock.com do, if you haven't seen it yet, the idea of crypto securities. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at the, uh, the stock market and how it works here in the United States, and if you go watch um, uh, Patrick Burns' uh, uh, speech at the uh, last Inside Bitcoin, if it was recorded, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he does a very good job of descri describing kind of how the stock market works. Most people think that when, you know, I buy a stock or you sell a stock, it's, you know, we've just transacted and stock and money changes hands. That's not really how it works, but then most people recognize, yeah, there's probably a stock broker that's there and you know, our brokers are facilitating, but that's not how it works. There's a contractual right built on top of a contractual right, likely yet again, another contractual right, and behind that is the DACC, which is again just a contractual right and similar to the Federal Reserve, it's not regulated and there's very little visibility into what's in it. And even the DACC doesn't own any of the equity behind them. There's yet again another entity that actually owns 100% of all the stocks that are being traded in the public markets. None of us have ever owned any. Uh, and, and you start looking at these systems. In this case, that's one that's working well enough. It'll take a long time. But you know, 10 or 20 years from now, I imagine the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, pretty much the entire equity markets are going to be, you know, we're going to be having digital sort of uh, crypto securities. So I find that to be fascinating, but I think it'll take a long time. But, you know, Overstock.com and these kinds of guys going out there and, you know, pointing out the issues and providing a, you know, an interesting solution for it, I think is great. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. Voting, I think, is a, a phenomenal sort of use case. You know, voter sort of corruption, you know, even exists in this country. And in some countries, it's an incredibly big problem. The idea of giving out a token that represents one vote to every person, you know, in a particular country where democracy exists with a public ledger, it's an uncorruptible, trustless voting system. You know, I mean, the applications for you know, this technology are 
anywhere where value is being transferred. Follow us on Twitter to be the first to know about new videos from the protocol.tv.